But going back to this ESG narrative, um, at the end of the day, back to making things very simple, it just crimps supply, right? So they're pushing these policies in place that would ultimately crimp supply and that would push prices up. Is that how you see that? Yeah, I would say that that's a second or third order effect. I mean, I think we really have to look at the root of ESG and where did this come from? And I, I was actually researching for your show. I wanted to brush up on my ESG, um, even though I talk about it all the time. I wanted to you know, be thoughtful about what I said today. And I discovered that it was actually brought into existence by the UN in the early 2000s as a way to reward companies that had these um, virtuous properties about them. But I would offer to your your listeners that, to me, ESG has become something of virtue signaling and less about the returns. And so the way that the ESG narrative has played out in the U.S. Um, and, and actually around the world um, is, is that ESG is, just doesn't pay to be responsible. So I heard this analogy recently that ESG is like giving wheatgrass to a cancer patient. But ESG is worse because it's the equivalent of giving the cancer patient wheatgrass and delaying the chemotherapy. So what do I mean by that? I mean that it's created two separate capital market structures. It's created a capital market structure that is free of you know, carbon or um, ESG related topics, and it's created the other market. And anytime that we have government interference, and that's what that is, right? That's state interference. Um, you don't have a free market and we must have free markets and we must advocate and fight for free markets because without them, we have no true um, economic activity. All economic activity is tainted. So, um, yeah, by coming up with this arbitrary scoring system, it's a way to really kind of impose controls, right? And so um, now they can force companies to get this score, um, which is made up of environmental, social, and governance scores, which pushes all types of things from their environmental impact all the way through their diversity on their board. Um, and it takes away, to your point, the free market, which is ironic because, you know, it seems like if these business owners are so greedy and we need to make them be more diversified, well, if they're so greedy, wouldn't they hire the best person for the job? Like, if I'm so greedy, I want my business to do well, then I'm going to hire the best person. I don't care what race, sex, color, whatever they are. Um, and so it's, it's sort of like a, a, a contradiction there. Well, it's interesting. So the development and the, and the path that BlackRock has taken – so a few years ago, um, you probably remember, they came out with a bunch of exchange-traded funds that were ESG um, compliant. Yeah. And they really heavily marketed those funds. And now recently, they have issued a statement. I'm going to read it to you just so you get the full, you know, this is exactly what they said. Uh, we believe that greenwashing is a risk to investors and detrimental to asset manager industry credibility. There is no evidence that buying low carbon ETFs leads to less carbon use. Mm -hmm. So ESG should be noted, those investments have out have underperformed every other investment, yep. every other type of investment. Of course, what's led the way in recent years is this energy. Yep. Um, there's a group called the Climate Action Plus 100 that claims to represent 50% of all asset managers, $60 trillion in assets under management. Wow. And in coordination, they've told companies that they need to cut their um, emissions or, or really improve their ESG um, metric. So this caused, of course, that, you know, so what's the effect of that? We eventually see prices spike at the pump because there's underinvestment into, um, with capital markets into businesses that are producing energy onshore, like we talked about, yep. which is necessary for national security. Um, so it leads to a spike in prices at the pump. And in the U.S., we have a term for that. That's antitrust. Yeah. Right? A group gathering together that influences price. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So, Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I, just, said, I said that's a good point. I haven't really thought yeah. about it like that. So BlackRock, Vanguard, and State Street voted on new directors at Exxon. This is, I think, a year or two or three ago. Yep. And after they did, Exxon cut their production targets by 20%. So think about, okay, they cut their production targets. What does that mean? That means that they stopped projects. 
They stopped exploration projects around the world. Who was there to pick those projects up, right? Many were, were already in the works of being developed. Yep. Who, who do you think was there to pick well, it up? Asia and China specifically, yeah. PetroChina. PetroChina picked up the majority of those assets. Okay, now let's see if you're paying attention. Who's the largest shareholder of PetroChina? BlackRock. BlackRock, I'm guessing, yeah. Right. I mean, this is not a free market when we have actors who influence or, um, you know, influence is a light word for what they're doing to these energy companies. We do not need states in energy markets. We don't need states in markets, period. Um, former Treasury Secretary Sarah Raskin has said that this forced investment coming through states is an attack on sound investment practices. It forces investments favored by politicians. That was a quote. Yeah. It, and anyway, I could yeah. ramble on about it. You're absolutely ESG. right. I, I, I find it's very offensive and it's been personally, it's affected my family and my friends. Um, you know, Bank of Montreal a couple of years ago, uh, they pulled out of their natural resource group. They had 90 employees in natural resources. And one of my family members was one of those uh, managing directors and, you know, went to work one day and they BMO, right? Bank of Montreal. So enormous energy assets in Canada. Um, they say, no, we're not going to bank energy anymore. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it hits everybody. I mean, back to here where I'm at, my, my gas bill went from $100 a month to 400 a month. And, you know, while I certainly don't like that, I can afford that. But what about the people that can't? I mean, yeah. it affects everybody. So it's insane. Um, I, I have seen quite a bit of backlash building. Obviously, we've seen a lot of Republican-led states. Well, first started divesting their funds from BlackRock. Billions of dollars were pulled from BlackRock because of that. And then I think, was there... 26 states that have like filed into a lawsuit about this ESG investing, Texas, of course, being one of those. Um, and so then there's a lot of backlash. I, be I believe it was Vanguard that now has abandoned their net zero goals. And now BlackRock is running PR like this going, whoa, 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 hang on, hang on. We're not like as bad as, as you think we are. So there's definitely a shift happening. Um, but I think maybe just a shift in the narrative, maybe not so much in the underlying practices.